Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, uh, Nuts for Art. Uh, here we are living in the United States of Awareness, and I'm about to read Poisoned Power by Dr. John Goffman and Dr. Arthur Tamplin. Uh, this is a book that was written in 1971, and we are now on Chapter 2. We made it through the forward in the first chapter in the introduction, so that's pretty good. We're on page 46. I'm going to take my glasses off so I can read better. Chapter 2. How radiation from atomic energy programs gets to you. What it does to you. To understand why there is grave concern about nuclear electricity generation, it is necessary to know just how nuclear reactor electric power exposes human beings and other living things to the danger of being irradiated. And it is essential to understand how a few extremely simple points about radioactivity, if we are to bypass the confusion on safety points generated by well-planned propaganda campaigns. The nuclear fission of uranium or plutonium releases enormous energy. This is the energy ultimately converted to heat, which produces steam to drive the turbines and produce electricity. If this were the only energy released when uranium or plutonium atoms split, nuclear electricity might well have been a real boon to mankind providing electric power for decades or centuries. Unfortunately, the fissioning itself is only the beginning. There is another source of energy involved. After the fissioning is completed, a source which creates the extreme radiation hazard that accompanies nuclear electricity generation. Let me read that sentence again. There is another source of energy involved. After the fissioning is completed, a source which creates the extreme radiation hazard that accompanies nuclear electricity generation. The uranium itself decays or disintegrates very slowly. This is why uranium is still present on Earth so long after the Earth is formed. Uranium is radioactive but only feebly so. The kind of uranium, uranium-235, which maintains the chain reaction in a nuclear reactor, decays by emitting so-called alpha particles very slowly. So slowly it takes 710 million years for one half of the uranium-235 atoms to disintegrate. Wow, half-life is 710 million years. For any radioactive substance, the time required for one half of it, of it to disintegrate is called the half-life. Thus, uranium-235 has an extremely long half-life, and consequently, the radioactive hazard of uranium-235 is very small. When a uranium-235 nucleus splits, two, usually, fission fragments of the original nucleus are produced. What are these fission fragments? They represent what is left after a neutron has disintegrated the uranium-235 nucleus and after some additional neutrons have escaped during the fission process itself. It has been discovered that these fragments are nothing more or less than variant forms of elements commonly occurring in nature. Oh, wow, look. Can you see that? That's pretty sweet. Let's see what he says about that. Huh. The vast majority of the variant forms of the elements found in the Earth's crust are referred to as stable. This means they do not decay radioactively or create radiation, as does uranium. The variant forms of any particular element are called nuclides of that element. So we can say that 
In nature, we find several stable nuclides for one particular element. The fissioning of uranium-235 nucleus can and does produce stable nuclides, but it also produces radioactive nuclides of many chemical elements. Any particular uranium nucleus has a certain probability of splitting or fissioning to produce any one of many hundreds of stable nuclides or radionuclides of many different chemical elements. Thus, while one cannot predict which stable nuclide or nu radionuclide will be produced by the splitting of a particular uranium nucleus, we do know with great accuracy now how many times out of a million uranium fissions a radioactive nuclide, for example, TIN-123 or iodine-131, will result. Huh. Remember that the stable nuclides produced when the remember that the stable nuclides produced when the uranium atom splits are the same as stable nuclides already present in nature. Huh. Let me read that again. Remember that the stable nuclides produced when the uranium atom splits are the same as stable nuclides already present in nature. Thus, biologically, they create no problem whatsoever. But the radionuclides produced at the same time represent most unwelcome byproducts of the operation of nuclear reactors for electric power generation. What? So long as the radionuclides remain in the nuclear reactor, they create no problem. True, some of the decaying radionuclides within the reactor do produce gamma rays, which can penetrate through steel or concrete. But sufficient shielding and distance can reduce any risk from this source of negligible level. But should such radionuclides get outside the reactor, they can and do so. A host of problems can ensue. The problems arise because humans and other living things can be irradiated by them. A human can be irradiated by such radionuclides from outside his body, quote, external radiation, unquote, or from inside his body, quote, internal radiation, unquote. There is no difference in biological effect whether the radiation ex is external or internal provided that the same amount of radiation is absorbed in a particular part of the body. The common form of radiation resulting from uranium fission all have the same effect upon living tissue which absorbs them. It also makes no difference biologically whether the tissue receives a specific amount of radiation in a given period of time from a radioactive particle of long half-life, like a thousand years, or from one of a short half-life, like just a few days. Knowing these basic facts, we can see that the only real issue that concerns us about any radioactive material is how much radiation is, is absorbed by a single portion of tissue plus the length of time in which this absorption occurs. In order to systematize all radiation measures, radiant energy absorption is measured by the RAD unit, R-A-D, in capital R-A-D. A substance is said to receive one rad of radiation when it absorbs a given amount of energy per gram that it, uh, of that substance. One rad delivered to a piece of muscle will have essentially the same effect whether it comes from a dental x-ray machine, from radioactive atmosphere irradiating the muscle from outside, from gamma rays from radioactive substances in the earth, or from radioactive substances taken into the body with food or water. And it matters not at all whether the source of radiation is a nuclear power reactor or any other source. One rad is one rad for nearly all types of radiation from 
any source for all practical purposes. If only the rads that are absorbed matter, why bother about external versus internal radiation or about the differences from one radioactive element to another? A. External versus internal radiation. Let's see how much time we have. We're at 10 minutes. I think I'll stop here. We're at this subtitle at the bottom of page 50. Oh, wow. We have a, a picture coming up of a rat. Uh, so page 50, and it's the new subchapter is A, external versus internal radiation. Well, thank you guys for listening to this, and I hope that this information makes you feel stronger like you understand it. I'm beginning to get it after reading that past book and this book. I actually am actually beginning to absorb it. So put your courage feet on. We definitely need them. And I, I don't know about you, but I feel like something's coming and we need to be prepared. Fill your water bottles because if we have earthquakes, your water bottles, the pipes will burst in an earthquake. So that's part of earthquake preparedness. And practically many millions of people on the, in the entire United States are in an earthquake zone. So fill your water bottles and get prepared. Ciao, you guys. <laughs> Put your courage feet on. Don't mean to freak you out. Bye.